We live in a dynamic and uncertain society. Challenges including climate change and the more recent shock of the global pandemic has only solidified this stance. Our next speaker is widely known for his work on uncertainty and has made fundamental advances in our understanding of how economic agents cope with risky and changing environments. It is my pleasure to introduce the recipient of the 2013 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences, Lars Peter Hansen. Professor Hansen is the David Rockefeller Distinguished Service Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago. He is widely known for developing the econometric tool Generalized Method of Moments, which has made revolutionary advances in numerous disciplines, including labor economics, macroeconomics, and finance. Professor Hansen's recent work focuses on the macroeconomic consequences of climate change, and he has co-authored a paper titled Pricing Uncertainty Induced by Climate Change. To hear more about his groundbreaking work, it is with great pleasure and privilege I invite to the virtual stage Professor Lars Peter Hansen. Great, thank you. Um, it's my great privilege to be here today, and I'm very happy to share with you um, ideas uh, that, that and uh, related to research which I've been working on. Um, so I'm sorry, I have a little bit of trouble with the slide technology here. I can't see my own slides. Oh, there we go. Very good. So my research is, you know, research is really much a collective effort, and, and I have collaborators from around the world and various different expertises. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about is the joint efforts of those type of collaborations. Um, the particular calculation, the computations I talk, I talk about will be related to some work I've done with uh, Brock and with, with uh, William Brock of Wisconsin and, Buzz, and Mike Barnett of um, of ASU. Now, of course, I'm not going to get into, you know, that we actually build models. They have their, you know, they're fundamentally stochastic. They involve solving partial nonlinear partial differential equations and the like. I'm not going to get into the technical details of that, but I want to talk about the overarching aims and ambitions of this research, why I think it's important, and how we're, th and, and how we're thinking about this problem in novel ways. So we can all, I believe, agree we live in an uncertain world. People, businesses, governments are all coping with uncertainty. Economic model builders, statisticians, decision theorists, control theorists, we seek to formalize constructive ways to embrace this uncertainty. And I'm going to be discussing uncertainty in the broadest of terms and, and, and illustrate its conjunction, its, its implications in conjunction with climate change. Now, I'm going to be giving you illustrations. They're not um, that there's there's going to be lots of complexities I'm, I'm going to be abstracting from, and uh, but but uh, but but the type of illustrations that I'm going to talk about really convey a much more broader message. So here's a, a quote from you know, Hayek when he won the Nobel Prize. He like other Nobel laureates are asked to write an essay related to their contributions that led to the prize, but they often speculate and talk about other subjects as well. Hayek wrote one of the more, more um, interesting or provocative essays. Um, one that I don't know that there's aspects of the essay which I would have definite disagreements with. He's very, very harsh and tough on the field that I, I, I like to contribute to, econometrics. But there's this is quote in here that I, that, that I think is really relevant and salient in terms of this, especially with the topics I want to discuss today. Even if true scientists should recognize the limits of studying human behavior, there's a public that has expectations. There's only people who, who uh, pretend or believe they can do more to meet the popular demand than what is really in their power. And, and, and I think this is true. If you look at scientists or economists or the like that as they try to influence policy, many times issues related to limits to, um, to our knowledge on uncertainty gets shunted to the background. And, 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 and I'm going to argue, I find that to be counterproductive, and, and that's important to actually integrate those, those considerations in, into our policy discussions. So in confronting policy uncertainty, there's this tension that shows up. Um, on the one hand, that we have limited understanding of this mechanism by which policy might influence outcomes, this economic or social outcomes. On the other hand, there will be kind of demand for precision on the part of public or government policymakers. 
Maybe we, maybe we need to have full confidence in our understanding of things before we actually act. So how do you deal, deal with that tension um, and, and uh, in ways that are constructive? So as two famous economists that were writing in, uh, at comparable times that, 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 that were really that, that themselves pushing hard to think about uncertainty in broad terms. One is the University of Chicago economist, one, one of the uh, kind of well-known uh, intellectual leaders of, of Chicago economics, Frank Knight, who, who's arguing that uncertainty really needs to be thought much more broadly than the notion of risk. R uh, risk is construct, which I'll be talking more about, is the one that's really covered mostly in um, economic analyses and textbooks. It's, it's situations where we kind of know probabilities but not outcomes. I'll have more, more to say about this. And, and so he's arguing, you know, way back in the 1920s that we really need to separate this from the, this notion of risk from broader notions of uncertainty. And there's potentially far reaching implications of making this separation. So Knight was writing about this, but he really didn't formalize it in ways that, that uh, led to that, that had direct implications for model building. And, and, you know, at Knight, Frank Knight was writing about uncertainty as well, sorry, John Millard Keynes was writing about uncertainty as well, arguing that we only have the biggest idea of any but the most direct consequences of our acts. Our, uncertain, uh, our knowledge of the future is fluctuating, vague, and uncertainty. And when we think about climate change, it's about speculations about the future. Yes, we're seeing some impacts of climate change now, but our real concern is it's going to get even worse as, uh, uh, as, um, as you go forward. So let me talk a little bit more about, I mentioned this construct of risk. And so risk I'm gonna take as a situation in which you might have an urn, say an urn, and you know the number of red balls and the, and the number of blue balls, say 75, 25. And, and, and then you pick them out at random. This is a case where you know probabilities, but you don't know outcomes. And, and this is how lots of macroeconomics models are built. This is lots of how lots of uh, microeconomic you know, models under, under uncertainty are built as well. Probabilities are what are known, but not outcomes. So now let's make it a little bit more complicated. We've got an urn, but we don't know the number of red and blue balls. I'm going to call this ambiguity. Now we can learn about the number of red and blue balls. This is kind of what statistics tells us by kind of drawing randomly out of this urn. The simplest version of this would be the law of large numbers, where if we draw enough times in, you know, independently, we, we can eventually figure out the, the fractions of red and blue balls. So we kind of learn our way out of this uncertain of this of, of this ambiguity. So maybe we should just maybe it's okay to just think about risk if we can actually eventually figure stuff out. But eventually it's kind of an interesting construct here. Because really in the environment where the world we live in, it's perhaps better to think about these urns. And these urns changing over time. So even though, even though you can learn, you're learning about a moving target. And so you kind of never figure things out uh, because, because the world's changing, because of changes. So, so it's, it's um, and, and, and I think that gets closer to the type of, <clears throat> you know, capturing the type of situations we're in. Yeah. So now let, let me just return to climate economics. Uh, there's this categorizations that emerged in discussions of um, uncertainty in climate economics. Unfortunately, it's been dominated by the con construct of risk. It's not you know, you know, trying to draw these important distinctions which I want to make. So they'll use the term physical risk and transition risk. And I, and I put it in quotes here because I want to think about these in broader terms. This physical risk is sensitive sensitivity, say, um, if we omit carbon in, in, in the atmosphere today, that's gonna to impact temperature, not only nearby in, in, the, in the next few years, but even more so down the road in 10 years and, and, and further out. So, that, so, so that's a type of physical risk. Another one is people talk about are these kind of environment, are these environmental tipping points that perhaps as we start pushing more and more CO2 in the atmosphere, we start getting you know, these temperature changes. Maybe at some point in time, you cross some threshold. Once you cross that threshold, much more dramatic things start happening. 
the, the, there's much bigger impacts on economic opportunities, on, 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 on the social outcomes, as well as on the environment itself. Those are notions of physical risk. And as I say, I want to think about those more broadly. Now, there's another construct called transition risk. Okay. So when we um, alter the environment, that's going to affect economic opportunities. Uh, economists like to capture this with so-called damage functions. But then there'll, then there'll be adaptation. So as we change the environment, we'll, the, we'll start figuring out ways to adapt to a new environment. And, and, and so that leads to a type of transition risk. So green technologies down the road might, might, might become more productive than, than they are today. Oops, I'm sorry, there's some, I'm not sure what happened here, but green technology, uh, um, the development of new clean technologies might become economically more viable down the road. We expect that they will. We don't know exactly when that will happen, but, um, but, to, but, but we see progress, technological pr progress uh, in, in, in new technologies can, uh, um, you know, can help out here. That's a type of transition risk. And finally, there's policies. The private sector is exposed to uncertain government actions. So as we're trying to um, deal with climate change, we're not quite sure what the policy, or what, what the policy responses will be. But, but, uh, but nevertheless, we have to take actions, you know, speculating, speculating on what they might be. Um, the, the, there's a so-called stranded asset problem in the sense of, you know, do, do you want to develop your um, kind of carbon dependent or exploit your carbon dependent assets now because because there'll be policies down the road that, that will make them very very costly so so that can affect your um, uh, economic behavior currently so, so these are types of uncertainties that, that, that we have to confront within the uh, climate economics arena so so i'm going to just give you a pictorial description of one of these the first one and this is we're going to omit we're, we're, we're going to emit carbon in the atmosphere today. What are its uh, its consequences for temperature in the future? Now, now what I'm going to tabulate here is predictions of so-called pulse experiments. These pulse experiments say, well, suppose we give these climate models, alternative climate models that include both carbon dynamics and temperature dynamics, some pulse of CO2 how they respond. Different models have different answers. There's heterogeneity across the predictions in the models. And this is capturing that heterogeneity. It's, a, it's you know, this is drawing on uh, some direct evidence coming out of, uh, out of, of, out, um, out of climate science. And, and, and so these pulse experiments give a way to do so-called model comparisons. And what, what we'll see is kind of a common qualitative feature to it. There's a climb after about 10 years, and then things kind of level off. Now, this leveling off is leveling off for an economist who thinks of you know, 50, 50 to 100 years as very long term, and not to a geoscientist who thinks of you know, you know, many, many centuries as long term, not, not, uh, not, you know, not 100 years. So there's further dynamics that play out over much, much longer time scales, which are of a keen interest to a geoscientist that I'm abstracting from with this picture. So what we're seeing here is the dash line is the average prediction across all the models. We could, we, we could just use that in our calibration, or we could start tabulating the 25th percentile, the 75th percentile, the 25th percentiles by the dotted lines. The, uh, the solid red line is the 75th percentile. And then the, there, there's 144 different model combinations here between carbon and temperature dynamics. The, the, uh, on the upper and lower envelopes of this pink region then tell you the, uh, yeah, the, you know, that, you know, the highest predictions and the lowest predictions in terms of responses. And so, and so what you get out of this is you see that you know, over the period of 50 to 100 years, you're, you're seeing quite a bit of heterogeneity in these predictions. Now, if we treated every model as being equ you know, equally plausible, then, then, uh, then we could use this tabulation to assign probabilities. But it's not entirely clear why you want to think of every model here as being equally plausible. And so we may well have some, uncertain, some ambiguity over that probability assignment. 
So now there's damages. So I'm giving you a very stylized depiction of damages that's used in some of the simplest calculations of, uh, of, of, of say, policy, um, economic policy related to climate change. And, and this is used in one, one, one of these damage functions. So let's think about um, measuring damages and some type of proportional reduction in um, aggregate consumption and, and aggregate economic output and kind of economic activity. Okay, this is a function of the temperature anomaly, temperature relative to a pre-industrial. And so think of us now as a little bit above one, one degree temperature anomaly. Um, the damages so far are, are arguably economically modest, but down the road, they could be more severe. So some people would argue, well, after a one, we should really guard against a 1.5 degree th threshold. After that, things will get more dramatic. But then what, is, what does more dramatic mean? So I've, I've, I've plotted out here a range of what more dramatic could mean. We, we get more curvature, but we don't know how much more curvature. It could be a lot, of, a lot more curvature, or it could be a modest amount, amount of more curvature. And that's captured by this um, kind of pink shaded region. Region here with the with the with the black line as being the, uh, uh, the yeah the kind of mean response. So there's arguably a lot of uncertainty about how much the damage will be even if we cross a threshold, say at 1.5. Now there's also arguments about where the key thresholds might be. Um, of some people have talked about a two degree anomaly. Some have talked about one degree anomaly where where where, where we expect the uh, damages to get more severe. So just pictorially, let me. Um, Imagine shifting things. So if we got two as a threshold, then 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 the steepness only kicks in much later, yeah, down the road in the future. Now we're talking about pushing the uh, world economies into places it hasn't seen historically. So consequently, we, we can't just look at historical evidence and, and, and expect this stuff to be magically revealed to us. There's there's um, there's real uncertainty in these damages as well. And, and, and there's uh, uncertainties about the thresholds as well as what happens after, um, after we hit those thresholds. And that's what these pictures are trying to you know, capture here in a very kind of simple stylized way. So now if we want to think about policy now, we're facing on the, what, I, what I think of as uncertainty trade-offs. And, and, and these figures I've shown you are, are, are kind of putting on the table or at least uh, what, what these trade-offs might be. One is, how much weight do we put on best guesses? We could go all in on just best guesses, you know, take our best guess and just use that for our calculations. But, or how much weight should we put on potentially bad outcomes when designing policy? So, you know, here's the best guess, but things could be worse. Should, you know, as a, as a society, perhaps we ought to be more cautious uh, and, and think about these uh, potential potential bad outcomes, but we may not necessarily put, want to put all of our weight on just the bad outcomes. There was a trade-off here between best guesses and bad outcomes. And if you look at like models that were, uh, were used during the pandemic and the early stages of it, uh, when people would talk about model predictions, it would often confuse notions of best guesses. Here's, you know, here's my best guess is what was going to happen to discussions of how bad could things be. And in designing policy, you have to think about that, that trade-off. There's another trade-off that's more dynamic in nature. Do we act now or do we wait until we learn more? Think about those thresholds. Suppose that after we cross a threshold, we learn about what that curvature is. Right now, we're not sure what it is, but once we cross it, we're gonna start get, you know, getting a lot more experience with things and we, get, we might quickly figure out what that curvature is. So we could wait until we cross a threshold, but on the other hand, it could be very costly for society to wait, maybe much cheaper for society to act now with this limited information, rather than wait until later uh, when, when they start, start damaging things a whole lot more to, to, to actually assess what the damages might be. So there's this trade-off between acting now versus wait, wait until we learn more. One, one of the arguments for deferring climate change, uh, change policy is, oh, well, you know, we should just wait until we learn more. But that could be very costly. It, it, it might be far cheaper for society to act now than to simply wait until we got everything figured out. So these are trade-offs, important ones. So the research that, that, that I and others are engaged in related to uncertainty here 
wants to take a broad perspective on uncertainty. We do want to include risk, unknown outcomes with known probabilities, but we also want to, uh, uh, you know, different models might tell us probabilities, but, but we don't know which models are the best, you know, are the best ones. So we want to have ambiguity, you know, unknown ways to assign to these alternative probability models. And then, of course, statistics help us think about how to update those, those, um, those weights as, um, as we get more evidence. But then finally, all the models we write down, you know, this is uh, true across all disciplines, but certainly in economics, they're highly stylized, they're highly simplified, but we still think they're insightful and useful. So to say the model's wrong is not much of an insight. To say it's wrong in important ways is what you, is it wrong in important ways is what you care about. So how do we confront this notion of the unknown ways in which a model might give flawed prob you know, probabilistic predictions? Of these three components of uncertainty, it's, uh, the third one is in, in many respects the hardest one to wrestle with and might be the most important. Now, there are tools for doing this, uh, for exploring these. They, they, they include form, uh, uh, the formulations that are very explicitly dynamic. Um, I've, ta I've tacked on this term recursive, which uh, uh, that's, it's, it's just a label that means that, they're, um, there's, that there's ways to make them tractable, to use things like counterparts to dynamic programming type methods in order to, uh, do, uh, in order to uh, solve them. And what this does, from my perspective, is it gives a better way to do what's called uncertainty quantification. It's important to uncertainty quantification that's designed specifically for dynamic economic models used for either private sector planning or government policy analysis. So yeah, the notion is once we think hard about how we want to use the models, then you want the uncertainty quantification with these different categories to, to address those, those, particular, those particular challenges. So roughly speaking, you know, you know, this is all kind of formal and mathematical, and blah, blah, blah. But roughly speaking, here's how it goes. We want to allow the models to be misspecified. We want there to be ambiguity across models. But the aim is to use the models in sensible ways. Yes, there are simplifications. Yes, there are abstractions. Let's not just throw them out. Let's, let's still use them, but sensibly. Let's not take them so literally, but, to, to, but use them sensibly. We don't want to give up on the tools of probability theory and statistics. I mean, they're very, very valuable tools. We still want to use those to limit the type and amount of uncertainty that is entertained. Now, the, I talk about these uncertainty trade-offs. Um, one is this, how much we dislike uncertainty about probabilities over future events. This then affects how, you know, this trade-off between best guesses versus um, potentially bad outcomes. The implementation is to basically target the uncertainty components that really the decision maker cares most about in an adverse way. What type of uncertainty can really um, um, uh, uh, have the worst have the, you know, have the worst consequences to society or to the decision maker. And the outcome of this is going to be still using probabilities, but kind of an uncertainty adjusted prob probability measure that isn't people's best guesses, doesn't capture their best guesses, but makes adjustments for uh, uh, for valuation that, that, that it encompasses this uncertainty in the broadest of terms and leads to what I think of as more robust decision rules. Okay, now let me you know, turn back to climate change. One of the policy um, metrics that's used in climate change is the so-called social cost of carbon. So, yeah, so in economics, we often figure out kind of what, um, what, what, what various marginal costs are and connect it to uh, what uh, various different market outcomes. Here, we wanna take a social perspective. What's it costing to society to, to, um, to emit carbon in the atmospheres. Climate change is the case in which we think of in terms of externalities that markets miss. Um, the fact that emissions, carbon emissions, um, affect the uh, temperature are not ca captured by the uh, prices you pay at you know, gasoline pumps typically. And so, and so we want to take a social price perspective. We can still use the tools of economics and marginal analysis. It's just, it's just that we um, um, need to take into account these externalities. And so the, this, this social cost of carbon shows up in cost benefit analyses. And, and in particular, if you want to design a so-called you know, Pigouvian tax, what's the way, you know, best, best tax to uh, um, levy on in order to capture, the, uh, to, in order to reflect this externality. <clears throat> 
turns out quite nicely, the so-called social cost of carbon is representable as a so-called asset price. So the tools that, that you learn in finance and investment theory, in which you kind of figure out how to assign values today to cash flows in current and future time periods, carry over here. The counterpart of the cash flows are these marginal damages, which you, which, which you uh, um, inflict on the economy and society in current and future time periods. We still have to do some form of discounting. They're stochastic. We have to adjust for the uncertainty and then bring them back to a current period value. So the same, same type of constructs that, 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 that we're familiar with from finance can, can, uh, can carry over here. But of course, we have to make sure we have to include this these externalities. So climate policy under uncertainty, um, there's many calls for um, immediate climate policy implementation. There's also limits to our understanding of timing and magnitude of climate change. And this has led to some apprehension. So what we do want to do is we say how a decision maker confronts this uncertainty in a setting in which there will be future information about damage severity. Once you start damaging the environment, we're going to start figuring out more about how that, that, that curvature than now, in, in, in which we're still in the low damage re, you know, region. But there's cost of waiting. Also, the value of future empiricism, data collection and the like, is going to have limited value at, um, in the near term because we're going to be eventually pushing economies into places that they haven't experienced historically. So, so we approach this using developments from so-called dynamic decision theory. Uh, they bring in these tools from control theory, from, um, from, uh, from probability theory, statistics, and the like, in, in order to address this problem. So what I want to start here is plotting what is roughly speaking the limiting values of those um, temperature responses to uh, carbon emissions. So this is a histogram of those responses, kind of treating all models, all the different models, all 144 different models symmetrically, equally weighted. And this is just the so-called, this is the histogram of those, of those limiting responses after 50 or 100 years. Now, li literally what this is, this is a discount response using a discount weight of 0 0.01, but it would but, but, but be very, very close to just taking what the limit values were at 50 to 100 years. So this is if we treat all models e uh, equally likely, but that, you know, e uh, equally plausibly, but there's no particular reason to want to do that. So... We want to explore some sensitivity to changing the histogram from this to something else. Right. Now, we're also going to have uncertainty in, in, in these damage thresholds. Formally, we're going to ca capture that threshold uncertainty, 1.5 versus 2, as a so-called jump process with, with absorbing states. These states just correspond to a specific magnitude of the curv cur curvature of the damage function beyond the jump date. So after the jump date, we figure out what the curvature is to, uh, to the damages going forward. Prior to the jump, we're just going to uh, put, um, put some uniform distribution over, over the potential damage curvatures. The uniform distribution is ad hoc, and, 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 and we're going to want to think about sensitivity to that as well. The decision maker does not know when the jump will be triggered. The only, uh, the only thing that is known is that the jump is becoming more and more likely as we increase the temperature anomaly. So as we um, make the temperature anomaly larger and larger, the chances of crossing this threshold increase on us, such that by the time we're at a two degree threshold, we've almost for sure uh, you know, um, crossed it. And prior to a 1.5, there's very little chance of crossing it. Okay, so these are all kind of inputs in the, into the models which we're building. But these probabilistic inputs we're putting in here, we don't want to take so literally. I mean, these are, these are just rough guesses. Okay. So, as, as, as I indicated, what comes out of this, in part, is this adjusted set of probabilities that don't reflect your best beliefs, but, but kind of reflect a type of caution which you might want to induce because, because you're unsure of, say, how to weight models. And so think of that red histogram, which we had before, 
And then there's, and then we're going to tilt things to the right because it's 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 the high climate sensitivity that this decision maker really cares about or is concerned about. And so we'll shift it to the right a little bit to make this adjustment. Uh, um, and you know, the, there's different amount. It just kind of depends on how averse you are to this uncertainty. Kind of dictates how far to the right you want to shift it. So I've just given you one illustration here. And so the blue lines are the shifted to the right ones, and then the purple are just the overlap. Now, there's also going to be these adjustments, so-called robust adjustments to the probabilities, which are assigned to the various curvatures. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is uh, give you three different specifications depending upon how confident you are in the original model. We're, we want to introduce model misspecification concerns. Okay. If you're really confident in the model, we start off with this uniform distribution across the uh, different damaged curvatures. And we might tilt it just a little bit, and that's given that you're so 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 the red, the red set of histograms here is the uniform one, and then the blue one says is is, is one that's slightly tilted. And again, we're going to tilt it towards the high curvature cases because that's what that, that that's what really concerns us. Now, a more a somewhat confident, somewhat more confident specification would have you tilt more, and that's given by the middle term, term here. Again, you're tilting towards the high curvature cases. And then a very extreme one might just might have you load up you know, much, much more heavily towards the um, um, high curvature specifications, depending on how averse you are to uncertainty. So, so now we can, we can combine these type of calculations. We've got uncertainty in the um, climate realm, we've got uncertainty in damages. They kind of, they, they, uh, these uncertainty can, can interact and reinforce, you know, the model calculations take this into account. And then we compute this so-called social cost of carbon, this, uh, this, uh, you know, this cost, which is the cost to society of uh, emitting more, more. And, and then showing you that uncertainty can matter here. I'm plotting things on a log scale, and, and we can just take the left plot here. And then if we kind of just just had went, went all in on the confidence and our probability assessments, we would just come up with this red line. But as we get concerned about potential misspecification or how we weight the different models, we, we could move from the red to the orange, which is a more modest amount. The somewhat concerned was the green one, is the green line, and then the blue one was the more extreme one. So going from the red to the green lines here, we're increasing the social cost of carbon here um, by a factor of by you know by about thirty percent, so this is a non-trivial adjustment even for the kind of more modest uh, um, entertainment of uncertainties. So so then these are the type of calculations. It's the situation where this cost of society because because we don't know things in effect goes up because because we expect society to have some degree of caution because of the uncertainty we're facing in the future. So now what happens after we cross the threshold? Those previous calculations were before the threshold. Now suppose we cross it. So after we cross it, in our very stylized world, you know the uh, um, you now know the damage curvature. We're, 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 we're trying to damage the environment a lot more, and it's getting revealed quickly to us what that curvature is. Now it could be good news. It could be, oh, well, we've crossed the threshold, but the curvature is really very modest. So, so that's potentially good news. So it's quite if you receive this good news, you might actually increase your emissions after you cross the threshold. <clears throat> but in a lot of cases, you're gonna either continue to be cautious or uh, or diminish it. So what this plot here shows you, it's this kind of highly curved region here is only a very over uh, a very small region of curvatures, of very low curvatures, and you might actually increase emissions, and then things flatten out. And so, so, so caution prevails over most of the region, uh, over most of the different damage curvatures, which might be, um, yeah, might be realized. So it's a very asymmetric response here. There's only a, a small number of these curvature realizations in which you uh, will, will suddenly get more, uh, more bold in terms of emissions. Okay, these are just like illustrations, but let me just summarize the type of, type of findings coming out of this. It identifies two key results. This, our, our fictitious social planner planning for the world economy exhibits initial caution until the damages are more for, uh, uh, fully revealed. With this information, the decision maker may be more wary or maybe more bullish depending upon the information that comes in. 
Maybe things aren't as bad as we fear, or maybe they're even worse. There is a pronounced asymmetry in the responses. There's gonna only be a small fraction of more bullish responses and, and then a clustering of uh, responses that are more cautious. So th this is the type of dynamic thinking that, I, you know, that can come into play, which, we, which we've got learning, we've got this learning channel on the table and, 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 you're, and, we're, and we're showing how you still wanna act now. Uh, um, and, th and then you might wanna you know, act even more cautiously or more bullishly uh, in the future. So let me just kind of summarize here on certain matters for policy tools like the social cost of carbon. Understanding the sources of, the, of, of these subjective uncertainty models used by either the private sector or by governments will make economic policy, in my view, more effective, more open, more honest, and more effective. With that, let me just close with a quote from my favorite American philosopher, education is the, Mark Twain, education is a path from cocky ignorance to miserable uncertainty. So uncertainty can appear to be miserable, but, but there are ways to deal with it constructively. And, and, um, and I'm trying to sketch out exactly, and, and I'm trying to illustrate exactly what those approaches might, what those approaches look like. Thank you very much for, for your time and attention. I, uh, I certainly appreciate this because I view these as very important problems and I hope you will um, share my views on this. With that, I'm open for questions. That was truly a very fascinating speech. Thank you so much, Professor Hansen. I believe we can now open the floor to questions from the audience. First, we have a question from Matthew. Do you think there is a way to quantitatively measure ambig ambiguity? That is, to at least an approximate in form of probabilistic metric. Yeah, so that's an interesting question in the sense of whose ambiguity do we seek to measure? So there's a discussion from the standpoint of society there, you know, part of what society has to make a decision about is do they want to ignore the uncertainty or do they, or, or, or they want to, you know, go all in and fear it a lot or do they want to be just, or, or just how averse are they to, um, to that uncertainty? So, so those are social preferences. Um, uh, I'm not, I'm not sure that I have a way to say, well, here's the exact way to measure what the social preferences should be. But we can also use these tools to model the behavior of private decision makers, investors, consumers, and, and the like. Um, there's lots of decisions in, in, in our daily life that uh, involve uncertainty. Decisions about how much education to get, what type of education you might want to get, what your, um, you know, you know, part of that is speculation of what job markets might look like in the future. And, and, there's, a, and there's a whole lot of decisions in our economic activities that involve speculations about the future. So there, there's different ways we can, um, we can proceed. My, um, my preferred way to think about that problem is, is um, to look at these kind of implied probabilistic adjustments and see how, how silly you, you think they look. Uh, the calculations I showed you, I started off with a set of benchmark probabilities, but they were just like really best crude guesses. And so how crazy do we think these tilts look like? Um, you know, in some cases, they, 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 uh, they might look very extreme, but in other cases, they might look you know, very, you know, very, very reasonable. And so you can then go through and ask, can you really, do you really want to dismiss that the, uh, these, uh, these, um, the, these alternative probabilistic specifications, or might you say those also look quite plausible to me? Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's one, one can alternatively try to, it's it's uh, look at experimental evidence. Um, experimental evidence has been challenging to, to tease out risk aversion from experimental evidence. So there's, some, there's been interesting attempts to try it. It's a little bit harder for ambiguity aversion because there's issue about how you transport from one environment to another. Um, I, I can learn an experimental situation and figure out so some guesses as how ambiguity averse a person is in that experimental environment. But then how, um, how do I transport that to a different um, real world scenario in, in which the underlying environment is much more complex. So, I, I, um, but, but one can look at actual behavior and, and, and you know, predictive behavior responses to also get some guesses as to what looks reasonable. So I like to use the tools of, of uh, statistics and probability to gauge what I think are plausible amounts of ambiguity aversion by, by, by looking at those probability tilts, but there's other ways to think about it. Good question. 
I believe that perfectly sums up the question. Uh, what may be done to instill confidence and reduce fears of transition risk? And is, th is this the role of a state or the pr private sector? I, mean, I think both has a, have a stake in this transition risk, so the so-called transition risk, although I'd like to think about that more broadly. Um, certainly businesses as they're, as, as they're, you know, as businesses are forward looking as well, and they're going to want to, you know, make speculation about what's going to happen in terms of uh, new technologies coming on board, what type of government activities might, might be coming on. So it's kind of important for them to take into account in their longer term planning, these, uh, um, these, tra these sources of transitional uncertainty. There's a, there's a question about whether governments, uh, in terms of their policies, how much should, should they be subsidizing new green technologies? How much should, 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 should they be subsidizing um, adaptation possibilities and the like? And, and, that's, and those are all involved very clearly issues related to uh, transition uncertainty. So I, I think there's really important roles for both. I mean, I, it's, it's, it's not kind of one or the other. Uh, they have a little bit different perspectives on them, and, uh, uh, but, but, I, but I think both should be, uh, should, should be on the radar screen of both. Thank you, Professor, for that answer. Another question we have is, when, cons when concerning uncertainty trade-offs, what is your opinion on discounting in climate change calculations, such as the classic Nordisk versus Stern debate? So once you put in uncertainty on the table, lots of, lots of aspects of that debate look really silly. I mean, that, 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 those debates ha are, are premised on a cost-benefit analysis in a world in which uh, pretty much in a world of certainty. Um, what we learn in part from asset pricing and, and, and in part from decision theory under broader notions of uncertainty that the type of discounting you want to do in these uncertain environments is stochastic discounting. There's different realizations in the future. Those different realizations you want to discount in different ways. There's not one discount rate that applies to uh, all possible realizations in the future. Uh, it, 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 so, 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 so discounting ought to be viewed as... Um, as, as uh, in a very stochastic fashion and not in this kind of you know simple-minded deterministic fashion so to the extent uncertainty is a big issue then, then, then they're not thinking they're not framing uh, the discounting question in the best way um, so in in our calculations the way this shows up is these these kind of adjusted uh, um, they show up as adjusted probability measures. It's the same type of insight that shows up in um, so-called derivative claims pricing, but it's, I mean, the tools are similar, but the outcomes, of course, are very different with a, with a very different motivation here. And so we get these probabilistic adjustments that take place because of stochastic discounting. And, and, and so, it's as, so, it's as, so it's, if, it's as if you're doing the discounting against these altered probability measures. But if you do the discounting with, against the original ones, you'll just get the wrong answer. So, so, so for us, the stochastic nature of discounting becomes very important. And, and, and this is one of the contributions of um, in, integrating uncertainties in a, in a more fundamental way into this uh, cost-benefit analysis. Professor, you've mentioned um, uncertainty trade-offs. Do you think that governments correctly balance the acting now and waiting in their responses to the pandemic? <laughs> Which governments? <laughs> I don't know. Good question. Um, you know, I'm not. You know, I'm not personally enamored with my own government's policies uh, along this dimension. So uh, I, I would hate to. I'm not going to say that, say they've got stuff figured out. What I'm hopeful is that um, the type as we get our modeling tools better and better developed to have quantitative assessments that that these can at least be guides to uh, more prudent policy making in the future um, and, and so i do think there's a, a scope here that economists engaged in these type of um, analyses can can kind of repose the uh, policy challenges and 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 can uh, lead to even more prudent decision making so there's lots of issues in like we, well we shouldn't cross a threshold you know a top 1.5 or two degree threshold as well those are this, those are equivalent to saying, well, there's this damage function that falls off a cliff once you cross, you know, cross those thresholds, but it probably doesn't literally fall off a cliff. There's, you know, maybe steep curvature, but you know, but, but, but there has to be some trade off there that this kind of uh, rigid threshold policy making is, you know, just kind of misses. Um, 
I mean, I, you know, as economists, we're always thinking about trade-offs, and, so, and, and, and so you really want to make sure you get those trade-offs on the table and openly discussed. Um, do I know the exact right best policy right now to engage in climate change? No. Do I think we ought to be proactive right now in, in terms of climate change? My own view, absolutely yes. Thank you, Professor. Our next question is: Should SMEs strive for green energy and be burdened and be burdened to go clean if the transition risk is high, but the climate sensitivity is higher? Um, so there's lots of attention these days, and it, you know, more generally, in trying to say, well, we should be um, encouraging investors to, get, uh, to take into account social social responsibilities when they're making their investment choices and the like, and, and we should um, be engaged in uh, monitoring the uh, uh, the social consciousness of individual firms and the like. Um, I think it's tricky business. I think it ends up being lots of shell games start showing up and there's lots of superficial stuff that's done that ends up not being real. I think it's very hard for policymakers to do credible jobs of monitoring those type of behaviors as well. Um, I think more potent policies, I think it's perfectly fine if, 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 if individual investors in their own portfolio tilt or shift, uh, shift their investments in certain directions. I think that's a perfectly reasonable, reasonable strategies on their part. I think for governments and governments and societies, we have to be thinking more in terms of should we be subsidizing more new technologies, uh, and if so, which ones? Um, uh, should we be uh, um, th those type of questions? If uh, if we're going to should we be doing cap and trade? Should we be doing carbon taxes? If if if, if if we tax carbon, exactly what should we do with the proceeds in order to make it politically viable? Uh, I, th I think th those are the more important questions that, that, that uh, and I think kind of putting this on investors and the like is, uh, as a solution, I, I'm just op not optimistic we're going to make a lot of headway that way. Professor, you've mentioned about social responsibility in investing and government policies. To what extent do you think developing countries find it more difficult than advanced countries to enforce all of this? And in that case, what should the developing countries do? So there's a very important question there. There's um, in some sense, developed countries in their past have done all this omitting as part of the, their development mental trajectory. They've had their opportunities to uh, 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 to engage in these higher pollution type of activities um, and or, or higher carbon emission activities. Do we now want to say developing, developing countries should pay, you know, should somehow pay an equal burden in terms of doing this? Um, I think arguably there's you know, the, the reach that we have to think about responsibility across countries whereby we do take into account the uh, uh, different positions that countries are in. And, and, and so maybe we should be asking more of developed countries in terms of uh, show, showing the burden, burden of climate change that, than let's say, let's say some of the developing countries. But that said, you know, if you, if you kind of, um, big countries like India and China are, are, are gonna be big players in this whole game and, and, do, and, and we just can't simply you know, ignore their type of um, contributions to this. But, but perhaps there has to be some type of notion of um, transfers or something going from more developed countries to developing countries to help them cope with climate change, uh, given, the, uh, un, given the unequal exposures in terms of, the, of their economies. I, I, I think it's a very important question there about how we kind of gauge the uh, cross-country trade-offs in, in terms of their uh, role in term, um, of addressing climate change. And, and, and it's something that's hard to wrestle with politically, but I think it's uh, almost necessary to do it. Thank you. I think that clarifies my question. To move on to the next question from the audience, what role and potential do you think nuclear energy can have as a sustainable and economic solution, especially in developing nations? Yeah. So I'm not an expert in nuclear energy, but 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 my own casual view is that for a long time it had too much of a negative reputation. Yes. Yes, there were some very highly visible accidents, and yes, we need to um, use nuclear en energy in smart and intelligent ways that uh, that that can protect society. But 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 I think that's all doable, and, and I think in many cases we ran away from nuclear energy far too quickly. And and, and, it, and I think in, you know 
until we get you know some very alternative clean ways to uh, energy sources i think that nuclear energy ought to very much be in the mix going forward thank you another question from the audience when considering tipping points should we factor these into carbon pricing even if it means it's costly absolutely i mean if we the only issue there is how to quantify the the, uh, the uncertainties attached to the tipping points. But I, I think we should absolutely take them into account. Um, and, and, and there's some important work that's been doing just that. And, and I think that's, uh, I, yeah, I, I mean, kind of the thrust of this whole research is uncertainties are, are, uncertainty is important. It's a first order consideration, not a second order consideration. And we shouldn't be shying away from it. And we ought to instead kind of put it um, up front and out there, including inclusive of tipping points. Thank you. Another question we have is, why has the private sector consistently mispriced climate, climate risks? For example, the flooding risk in developing nations. Consistently mispriced is a little bit of a a little bit strong, um, perhaps. I, I, I did, it's, it's really hard to document that fully empirically. Um, but I didn't. I I didn't think there is a concern that um, that if we're kind of using models that the, 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 the we calibrated in the past, and we're now engaging in climate change, which is changing the uh, changing the rule going forward, that there that that unless the models in, uh, integrate in more explicitly climate change that they can uh, you know give false predictions and, they, and, and, and it's possible then that whole sectors of the economy can underestimate the uh, uncertainties attached to climate change so i think that is a possibility and i think there is a kind of a social research rule to try and guard against that to figure out better ways to integrate in climate change uncertainty into you know, business planning as well as societal planning um, uh, you know, one of the reasons, you know, central banks have recently become very, very interested in, in climate change. And I think one of the, you know, credible reasons they, ought, you know, they might want to be concerned about it is that maybe the whole financial sector might be collectively um, mi misrepresenting the exposure to uh, climate change. And so that, I think, is a, a challenge for, for, for both academics, the private sector, and the government to, to, to figure out better ways to um, quantify societal and, and, and uh, ec economic exposure to climate change. Again, this is, these, these uncertainties, I mean, yes, we have lots of historical experience in terms of floods and the like, the part with the, with the, that our historical experience is limited with regard to is once we start ch changing the environment, how is that gonna change those, those, uh, yeah, those type of probabilities? And if, when we see them Increase is that just some transient blip, or is that some some permit change induced by climate change? So, uh, there's a, there's some important uh, measurement challenges. So um, I guess it's a I, I see a very important measurement challenge here, and and I really hope that research can help us understand this better. Professor, if you could go back to the case of developing countries again. Do you yeah. believe that in combating this uncertainty with climate uh, climate change, there is in developing countries there is a gap in information or research available? And in this case, should international organizations or advanced countries do more to aid developing nations? If, if so, a step of aid one could give in terms of knowledge gaps, I, I, I'm all in favor of trying to close knowledge gaps. I mean, if it's real. There's really, I think there's no really good reason to be hoarding knowledge, uh, at least from the standpoint of societies. Um, so I do think there's, it, it, uh, uh, to the extent there's um, missing information and knowledge that's being shared, uh, that's, that, that needs to be transmitted, then yes, I think there should be, I'm, I'm all in favor of that. The other, the other question is subsidies. How much should like um, developing countries be subsidized by developed countries in terms of you know you brought the question of say developing nuclear energy or the, um, or, the, or the like energy sources that are that are um, that are cleaner um, instead of making those countries flip the bill themselves maybe there's an important rule for for the developed countries to be uh, um, um, 
be engaged in those type of investments. Now, the hard part of all this is 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 that governments don't have a great track record as being a venture capitalists. Uh, they they you know they often get their you know, their choices of uh, prudent societal investments often get polluted by political considerations and um, and kind of misallocated. So 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 we have to figure out smart ways to put the money out there, but allocated intelligently and not and, and not within the political arena, so that we don't get a bunch of uh, projects that have great advertisements but uh, not much behind them. Thank you, Professor. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. Uh, this is from the audience. If the global climate environment is a complex system, feedback effects make marginal effect estimations less useful. What, what stats or method would you choose instead? Yeah. Okay, so let me go with the marginal effects question. Um, if the... Yeah, so there's two different notions of social cost of carbon. One is that we take the current world economy and do small perturbations around it, and we do marginal calculations. And a lot of the social cost of carbon calculations are of that flavor. And and I agree that those 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 are limited. The, the type of models we're looking at have to do with looking at global global changes in policy, not just local ones. And so when we're doing marginal calculations, it's, 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 it's around socially efficient allocations and not current allocations. And so when you think about designing Peruvian tax policy, that's, that's a relevant marginal calculation of what you'd want to do. But, we're, but the whole reason to have these computational models is to be able to entertain global policy changes and not just local ones. Thank you, Professor. Um, I think, uh, unfortunately, with that perceptive answer, we must end our session today. Okay. I'd like to thank both the professor and the audience for this very engaging session. Thank you. Thank, thank you for being with us.